So, um, um, can everyone hear me just fine? Yes. yes. All right. Um, so some of you may be wondering why am I on one knee before you, um, and uh, some of you may know the answer to that question. Um, but I am choosing to give this address uh, on a knee to symbolize solidarity um, with protests and with activists in the United States of America who have been protesting for years now police brutality and the impunity with which police officers in the United States kill black and brown people um, and, and also kill uh, indigenous uh, people as well. So um, in the last few weeks, there have been a lot of celebrities and uh, notorieties who've uh, joined in this effort, but they have sort of um, couched it in this display of diversity and inclusion, but that's not what it is. Um, it's, a, it's a somber uh, occasion, it's a somber note, and I just want to center that and to uh, let all of you know that this is the origin of that protest, of that gesture, and I am standing here in solidarity with that today. So as Catherine said, um, the title to my talk is In Search of an Archive of the Oppressed. I actually added a prefix to that, um, and the prefix is Diversity's Discontents. So the full title of my talk is now Diversity's Discontents in Search of an Archive of the Oppressed. So yesterday marked three months exactly since I announced my breakup from the archival profession, and I'm afraid to admit that I made the biggest mistake of my life. I'm just joking. <laughs> <laughs> um, but every joke they say has a bit of truth to it. In the last three months, I've attended two professional archivist conferences <laughs> on two different continents, so evidently I miss you all, right? <laughs> well, not exactly. Since, parking up my, since packing up my apartment in Philadelphia and moving north to Cambridge, I've had a new lease on life. I changed my diet, I started exercising more, I ride my bike to the grocery store and to the barber shop, I lost about 15 to 20 pounds, and I bought a new bed, I've read three life-changing books. Um, I still don't have a grown-up beard, um, <laughs> but besides that, I'm basically living a life of an ex-girlfriend or ex-boyfriend who got dumped and is now giving motivational talks about how great <laughs> their life is and um, how that person never really deserves you in the first place. Um, <laughs> So you may be asking, why is he opening the closing keynote with the relationship metaphor? Did he get dumped in real life? Uh, no, I haven't, and my beautiful, wonderful partner is here in the audience today. Let's please clap for her, Karina. Um, and I wanna highlight the emotional labor that uh, she exerts just being around me on a regular basis um, and around archivists on a regular basis. Um, this is now her third thing of archives that she's been to uh, in three different countries. So um, pretty soon she's gonna get like a, a medal or some sort of certificate. Um, and she's never fallen asleep. So I think that's an accomplishment. So no, I didn't get dumped. Um, but I use this relationship metaphor because when I announced my departure from the archival profession, many archivists, many of whom I had never met in person, reacted as if I had broken up with them personally or professionally. Some expressed shock, others confusion, and of course, others spread the occasional uh, hateration or holleration, those are terms we use in the US. Um, and while I did receive well wishes on the whole, the conversation on Twitter and in person at the Society of American Archivists annual meeting in Portland, Oregon this past July, it constantly returned to one question. And that question was, as a profession, what can we have done to keep you? And the absolute truth is nothing. To further the relationship metaphor, this breakup isn't about you, it's about me. <laughs> it was about what I needed and what I wanted in life. We had some good times and we made history together, quite literally, <laughs> but it was time for me to move on, see new people, to read new books, to engage new ideas. Perhaps a bigger question is, why did keeping me mean so much to so many of you? 
Let's momentarily ignore the latent anti-blackness laced within the capitalist and property-based notions of keeping, because after all, archivists, we keep files, records, and other in inanimate commodities that can be traded in the hopes of producing a surplus value, material or otherwise. So what are we to make of this idea of keeping black people? What value was provided by this keeping, for whom and to what end? As a black, cisgendered, heterosexual man with an advanced degree, I became keenly aware of the value, utility, and purpose proffered from my keeping. My positionality and proximity to patriarchy via my gender, sexuality, and educational pedigree simultaneously signaled a safety and security to white liberalism, a safety that I would have more to lose than to gain by meaningfully disrupting patriarchy, and a security that my presence assuaged the anti-black attitudes of white people in my workplace, in professional societies, and the like. Yes, I am assured that I excelled as in my job as Princeton University's first and to date only digital archivist. Yes, I am assured that I excelled, uh, yet I am also assured that my excellence accrued an unearned currency that does not accrue for black women, for queer folks, and those archivists who attended or worked at less prestigious institutions. Academia is not so coded language for white and wealthy institutions. And so they thus don't project or protect whiteness via the intersecting identities that they present. Both of the preceding sentences are simultaneously true. That latter sentence remained apparent throughout my archival career as numerous people attempted to erase the labor done by people like Stacey Williams, Jasmine Jones, Melissa Hubbard, Rosie Mendez, Elena Colon Moreto, Elvia Arroyo Ramirez, and Lynn Durgan, to name a small few from projects with which I have been intimately involved. Quite literally, nothing, and I mean nothing, that I ever accomplished in my archival career came without the participation, and in some cases, guidance of all those names that I just mentioned. Their erasure, I should say, served a political project. And in addition to being sick of that shit, I knew that this project wouldn't get any of us any closer to freedom. It may have given me prestige, power, or even a pedestal, but that's not the purpose with which I pursued an archival career to begin with. In addition to failing to bring us any closer to freedom, I felt that this political project of the erasure actually brought all of us further away from it. So I provide this context to foreground my closing address at the 2017 Australia, Australian Society of Archivists Conference because your theme, diverse people, diverse collections, and diverse worlds needs a provocation, which is my personal pastime. <laughs> I spent the formative years of my career learning the art and science of provocation from Vern Harris, who opened with yesterday's keynote. So I hope I do justice by him with my remarks today. And given the woefully white worlds of archives in the United States and Australia, um, and right now I just want to pause and uh, give a round of applause to Catherine Howard for, uh, and all the other conference organizers for bringing us here today. So uh, please. Let's... So um, Catherine reached out and asked me to speak this afternoon on the topic of diversifying the archival profession and specifically in her words, as a solution, quote, as a solution to reducing the whiteness of archives. And I hope she'll permit me just a little bit to push back on two parts of that diction. Firstly, I should say that I'm not interested in reducing whiteness, no more than I'm interested in reducing oppression, reducing capitalism, or reducing prison populations. I am interested, first, foremost, and lastly, in the complete abolition of all of those. And while abolition is an ongoing process without a finite ending point, and while abolition is an ongoing process and a praxis with no finite stopping point, I want to go on record as claiming that any reduction of those concepts in which I engage is in service to their eventual abolition. Secondly, whiteness of all concepts in the world is the one least deserving of air quotes. Whiteness is real, it's tangible, it's in this room, it's in the collections that you process, it's in the collections that I used to process at Princeton. Whiteness is far from a figment or a fiction. Whiteness is in fact key to understanding the world. I genuinely appreciate the invitation to speak before you today, and because of that appreciation, I will slightly amend Catherine's question, if I might, 
in order to align it with more precise language. And I derived the precision of this language from Michelle Caswell and the work she and many others, uh, Ricky Punzelin, who's here, uh, the work that they've done in the previous year around dismantling white supremacy in archives. So to unite the two streams of the initial invitation in this more precise language, the question I hope to consider before you today is, how, if at all, does diversity form part of the solution for dismantling the white supremacy of archives? By pulling from my direct experience within the sphere of archives in the United States and using a dialectical method to, display, to, to place those experiences in conversation with the Brazilian educator and philosopher Paulo Freire, I will argue that dismantling white supremacy in archives requires archivists abandon the neoliberal discourse around diversity and instead adopt an archive of the oppressed or a cooperative approach in which, impress, in which oppressed peoples are positioned as subjects in our own liberation. So allow me, if you will, to start this diatribe on diversity by stating that during my six years in the world of archives, two as a student and four as a professional, I have benefited both materially and immaterially from many diversity programs and initiatives, including ones led by the Society of American Archivists, which is the largest professional organization of archivists in North America. It's important that I qualify my positionality here because I offer the following critique, not because diversity efforts didn't benefit me personally. In fact, they did benefit me. So it is in fact against my personal, financial, and egotistical best interest to argue in opposition to diversity initiatives that have rewarded me in those realms. But I do so with humility and dignity and with humbleness and with pride. I know my capabilities as well as my limitations and I'm comfortable and confident admitting to both. So with that qualification on the record, I wanna offer a concise account of my involvement in helping to conceptualize and plan SAA's first ever liber liberated archive forum, which occurred two months ago at our annual meeting in Portland, Oregon. And I offer this account because of all of my frustrations with SAA over the uh, years, and trust me, I have plenty of frustrations. Um, this attempt is not only the most recent one, but it's also the one within SAA that I have been most intertwined as an organizer and a planner. And because of that intimacy, it feels more palpable and proximate. From that palpability and proximity, I'm able to describe in detail where diversity falls apart, who gets most impacted by this falling apart, and what organizations that claim to want more diversity should be mindful of. The planning for this then unnamed idea started in earnest during the summer of 2016. I had, by this point in my career, given up on professionalism. I know Vern said he gave up on it like in the late 90s, but I only lasted about three years and I <laughs> had enough of it. Um, so I'd given up on professionalism and the organizations that cling to it so desperately. Uh, just a year prior, so back in 2015, I was a part of a group of archivists and community activists that pulled off a Herculean task of creating and publishing an archive of police violence, a task we explicitly executed outside the official bounds of the Society of American Archivists. Um, and this is despite the fact that we use the occasion of that gathering to organize and galvanize attention for this launch. Um, so next week, I'll be giving a talk uh, at my current university in which I talk more about that choice of why we chose to start this archive independent of the Society of American Archivists. Um, but suffice it here to say that the archivists and the activists had every reason to believe that SAA would water down if not completely sabotage our project. In a sense, we didn't give SAA a chance by using its deceptive defense of diversity to fuck this up for the people in Cleveland or for the culture. So, Vern, there's your fuck. You wanted someone to say it. <laughs> um, <laughs> there may be another one. Um, so it was amidst this lack of faith um, in SAA and professional organizations at large that I agreed last year in July of 2016 to help plan a new addition to the SAA program for its 2017 conference. In addition to having a world of trust and love for the person who asked me to join, I also tried to adhere to the concern that Ricky Punzelin asked yesterday at the Vern's keynote, uh, in which he basically asked, how should those who remain in professional organizations make the change happen that they want to see? I think that's a really important question. So 
surely if all of us vacate, what will happen to both the work and secondly, the people who get most impacted by that work? So while those two considerations and questions, with those two considerations and questions on my mind, I joined the planning team of this uh, unnamed forum with the understanding that I and two other amazing archivists will have autonomy to carve out a new type of experience during, to, during the Society of American Archivists meeting. One free of the same old formats featuring the same old speakers speaking about the same old shit. Um, and I did know the other two archivists quite well, but their reputations preceded them. Uh, and I felt honest, honestly honored to have the chance to work alongside them on such a pioneering project. I saw this also as a chance to put into practice some of what I learned in helping to plan under the direction of Dr. Mary Rizzo, an annual public history unconference held in New Jersey that Dr. Rizzo started in 2015. And if you're at all interested in looking this up, the name of this conference is the Untold Histories Unconference. Um, so after a few conference calls with the two other archivists and the original person who brought us together, on July 21st, 2016, the four of us, we settled on naming this event the Liberated Archive Forum, a, fo a deliberated archive, a forum for envisioning and implementing a community-based approach to archives. Our original description of the forum, which I will read in full, stated, quote, the purpose of this forum is to convene community members, organizers, activists, archives, archivists and allies to engage each other as equal partners in the pursuit of justice, freedom, and liberation work. Topics addressed at this forum might include, but are not limited to the role of records, documentation, and archives as they relate to human rights, gender equality, indigenous rights, post-colonial struggles, immigrant rights, state violence, environmental justice, LGBTQIA rights, et cetera. The desired environment of the forum is inclusive, respectful, accessible, and anti-oppressive. So um, this was, uh, as we would say in America, a pretty lit description. Um, it was live, it was crunk, it was cracking. Those are all uh, sayings that you can feel free to look up on Urban Dictionary if you want to. Um, <laughs> the thing about that description, though, is that it never saw the light of day. Um, the description of the forum after several revisions from the Society of American Archivists um, General Program Committee and the Society of American Archivists Council changed this description to read, the forum will bring together archivists from around the country and members of the communities in the Portland metro area and beyond to envision how archivists might partner with the public to repurpose the archive as a site of social transformation and radical inclusion. There are two goals for the forum, to provide community members with tools, techniques, and human connections they can use to transform themselves as they need and desire, and to provide archivists with the tools, techniques, and human connections that they can use in their own communities to transform the way in which the human record is documented. <sighs> so below that published description, which you can read for yourself once I post the text of this talk onto my Medium page, you will find examples of subjects uh, that prospective presenters, which are, again, that's not a that was not originally a part of the plan and is not how you do an unconference, um, uh, there was a list of subjects from which presenters might address. The most potent words that formed part of that original description, as I just articulated to you, were now gone. So there was no more mention of freedom. There was no more mention of liberation. No more mention of state violence. No more mention of rights, indigenous, post-colonial, environmental justice, LGBTQIA anti-oppressive, all of those words were stricken from the published description. So, and in my view, these words were stripped from the description and replaced with gentler language that could fall comfortably, um, not only on white liberal ears, um, gently, but also on white conservative ears, uh, not too harshly. And so you may wonder, how does such a stark switch happen? Um, and to be quite honest, I don't know the, quite, I don't know the direct answer to that. Um, as I used to tell people when I worked, that information is above my pay grade. Um, but I do know that SAA intertwined itself more and more into the direction of the forum, much to my chagrin, oftentimes in ways that weren't entirely transparent. And I also know that I experienced quite a few seismic developments in my personal life, admission to graduate school, a serious health scare, um, and a life-altering car accident that led me personally to withdraw a lot of my active participation in the forum planning. That said, it actually wasn't until preparing for this address that I looked back at our original description from last year and compared it to that final version. 
And the gulf between the spirit of the two descriptions substantiates the frustration and the unfamiliarity I felt when I attended the forum on July 29, 2017 at the Oregon Convention Center. The vision, the fire, and the fury with which we originally formulated the forum fell mostly flat in my view. The tone and tenor of the sessions resembled too closely the tone and tenor of most SAA sessions. The shades of the people in the room resembled the, uh, too closely the shades in the room in regular SAA sessions. And this is a difficult realization to reach, and this is not to negate the connection building and learning that did occur that day, because I do think connection building and learning happened that day at the forum. Um, but this realization serves to remind me that the radical freedom that birthed the idea had all been vanquished. Um, what remained was a remnant of that social transformation and radical inclusion that we sought to cultivate. So the best way that I can reconcile this result is that the Society of American Archi Archivists simply did what organizations do while they profess their devotion to diversity. They simultaneously undermine potentially transformative, transformative, if not flawed, projects in order to manage, not to eradicate, not to eliminate, but to manage existing inequalities. The British-Australian scholar Sarah Ahmed describes this phenomenon perfectly in her 2012 book, On Being Included, Racism and Diversity in Institutional Life, which is a book she wrote about colleges and universities, but I think it has a lot of import to archives and libraries as well. Sarah wrote, quote, what is problematic about diversity by implication is that it can be cut off from the programs that seek to challenge inequalities within organizations and might even take the place of such programs in defining the social mission of universities. The institutional preference for the term diversity is a sign of the lack of commitment to change and might even allow organizations such as universities to conceal the operation of systemic inequalities. Diversity can thus function as a containment strategy, end quote. To be clear, one can read SAA as a prototypical professional organization with its overstatements to diversity. I do not have any evidence to maintain that anything about SAA is different from other organizations in the United States. But I do have the evidence that if you go to the SAA website, www.archivist.org, and you enter the word diversity into the search box in the top right corner, 9,520 results will appear. One of those results points to the organization's statement on diversity and inclusion, which indicates that SAA interprets diversity to include two types of factors, sociocultural factors and professional and geographic factors. And I don't even have the time to interrogate the problematic adjoining of the second type, so just let me look very closely at the sociocultural factors of diversity that the Society of American Archivists delineates. So SAA determines sociocultural diversity from its equal opportunity and non-discrimination policy that it drafted in 1992 and updated most recently in May of 2016. In that policy, SAA defines 14 bases on which it will not discriminate as an organization. Expected bases on this list include race, religion, national origin, gender, sex, and sexual preference. Unexpected, if not a bit ambiguous basis on this list included individual lifestyle, family relationship, and veteran status. Because, of course, the multi-centuries long genocide and terrorism against black, brown, and indigenous communities, as well as women, merit the same protective status as former military members who may well, in the course of their duties, been responsible for executing said genocide and terrorism. So this is an equation I'm sure we can all agree uh, is balanced and makes a lot of sense. Um, but noticeably absent from those bases of, discrim of discrimination on which SA would not discriminate or hire um, are issues of class and issues of criminal conviction. So the organization then has professed not to discriminate along lines of race and gender, but has not afforded that same protection to poor people and people returning from prison to communities that, if you know anything about the United States, uh, are overrepresented among people of color and increasingly women of color. So these emissions of poor people and incarcerated, informed incarcerated people, which is common in many organizations in the United States, constitute the danger, delusion, and disingenuous nature of diversity programs. In addition to prioritizing cosmetic changes over cultural ones, diversity attempts, SAAs specifically, attempt to cure a system while ignoring the sickness. The symptom, low minority representation in the archival profession and in archival collection, subsist from the sickness 
white supremacist, capitalist, heteropatriarchy. The sickness begets the system and not the other way around. So absent any acknowledgement or action about white supremacy and the capitalist ex exploitation to which it is intimately wedded, at best diversity is an incomplete and insufficient bandage on a gushing and deep flesh wound. Thus, those archivists and archives that are interested in diversity as an organizational and managerial concept should recognize its impotence at dismantling white supremacy in archives and seriously consider uh, its abandonment. So what's next, right? Now that I'm done with my dissertation on diversity within the context of archival organizations, I want to introduce a word that I think will bridge, um, I want to introduce a word that I think will bridge the search of an archive of the oppressed with this dissertation. And that word I want to introduce to you is chiriarchy. First name and described by the theologian Elizabeth Schusler Fiorienza, Kyriarchy theorizes that all individuals can simultaneously oppress and be oppressed, depending on how a person's complex identities intersect, interconnect, and interact in relation to the complex identities of those around us. Kyriarchy is useful because, among other contributions, it explains that oppression is conditional, contextual, and contingent. This is the complexity for which diversity schemes, like within SAA and other man, uh, mainstream organizations, fail to account. These schemes ignore that the inversion of, impression, of oppression is as fluid and frequent as rainfall in the rainforest. And so it is from this theory of chiriarchy that we can begin to complicate the concepts found in Paolo Freire's Pedagogy of the Oppressed and begin journeying towards an archive of the oppressed. But before getting to that point, I should contextualize how and why I read Freire's text so closely. Uh, the short answer was I didn't have a job anymore. So when you don't have a job, you read more things on your own. Um, but the longer answer is, during my time as an archivist at Princeton, I voluntarily taught college level writing courses to students incarcerated in two young men's prisons in New Jersey. Um, and from this experience, to which I attribute most immediately my reason to leave the profession and go into graduate school, um, I searched for texts to help me both process what unfolded inside the prisons um, and also inspire a reimagination, a reimagination of educational spaces, spaces within and beyond communities of currently and formerly incarcerated people. And so, ironically, I hope to read Pedagogy of the Oppressed in my flight from the archive, but in that reading, I actually ended up returning to the archive. So, in the book, Freire advances uh, this notion of the banking model of education, a model in which teachers who are always the subjects, deposit facts, knowledge, and information into the minds of the students, who are always seen as the objects. <clears throat> knowledge, in this sense, becomes an inert, one-way commodity that, one, that at once stifles students' creativity and prevents their ability to reveal or transform the world around them. This characterization of the banking model of teaching corresponds well with critiques that I and others have, in this room have made about the commodification of the archival record, as well as the power dynamics imposed by the omnipotent archivist and uh, onto the disempowered researcher. The archivist, via appraisal, acquisition, and description, assembles bodies of documents containing those sets of facts that they have themselves deemed, usually arbitrarily and, um, and inconsistently, to have enduring value. So the user requests some subset of these documents and dutifully mines the archive like miners for gold, but is rarely able, just like the students, to, to reveal and thus transform the world around them. And uh, I'm going to give a reference to the OIS reference model, uh, which I'm sure many of you here know. Uh, but this OIS, uh, the Open Archival Information System uh, reference model, reinforces this process um, and quite fittingly quite fittingly uses the neoliberal language of producer, manager, and consumer to describe it all. And the development of digital asset management systems and the theories that undergird them further extend the money metaphor. So in response to this banking model of education, Freire implores two things, the practice of problem-posing education and the collapsing of the subject-object binary into the creation of teacher students and student teachers. Central to both of those concepts is the presence of the dialogical process, 
which Ferreira argues comprises the essence of liberation and must emerge between two subjects, not between one subject and one object. The obliteration of the subject-object relationship is thus instructive to practice an archive of the oppressed, which will likewise abolish the archivist user binary and require subjects in all aspects of archival processes. For Freire, however, only the oppressed can develop and practice the pedagogy of the oppressed. For as he states, it would be a contradiction in terms for the oppressor to implement a liberating education. And this is where I think the theory of hierarchy complicates Freire's analysis, as it is hierarchy uh, pod, that, which posits that each person possesses the, cap, the capacity to oppress and likewise be oppressed. As such, to practice an archive of the oppressed requires not only a, a cooperative commitment to collective liberation for all, but also a constant self-reflection by all subjects of the ways in which the oppressor manifests itself within each of us, as well as the ways in which those manifestations impede liberation for us all. It follows then that an archive of the oppressed requires rethinking and reimagining all dynamics of the archival process alongside and in communication with and not for oppressed communities for the purposes of our mutually dependent liberation. An archive of the oppressed reminds us of a reality that discourses on diversity dilutes. The reality that they are us and we are them such that we will all live free or all perish imprisoned. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jarrett. Yeah, that was absolutely fantastic. And really appreciate you kneeling throughout all of that. There's been quite a lot going on. Uh, and some really good memes actually coming out on Facebook, if anyone has happened to have seen, seen them. Not to make light of it, but, but they are saying, you know, if you think that this is just a protest at the American flag, then, you know, you've got it wrong, basically. Uh, and others along the same lines. Yeah. So, any questions, comments? Jared, I'd just like to ask you about the archive of police violence. Was that a kind of WikiLeaks-like type project? Can you just talk about the nature of that project very briefly? Sure. Um, so it was not a WikiLeaks-type project. It was a project that happened uh, spontaneously because the Society of American Archivists had its annual meeting in 2015 in the city of Cleveland, Ohio. And prior to our arrival, one of the really high-profile cases of uh, police misconduct resulted in an acquittal of the officer um, and uh, so it was amidst this protest that archivists going to Cleveland decided that we would um, like to lend our services um, as archivists to people in, in Cleveland who were afflicted and afflicted by, uh, from the effects of, of police violence. So um, it was a sort of a grassroots effort between local community activists who um, wanted to display publicly a lot of um, video and, and uh, tribunal documentation um, that, they had, that they had recorded prior to our arrival. And we also recorded oral history testimonies on the streets of Cleveland during the conference. So um, that's a, a pretty, I mean, that's as short as I can say it. I've given like 50 minute lectures on it. So, um, but if, if uh, you or anyone else is really curious, um, if you just pop into Google, a search for my name is Stacy Williams and Power to the People, you'll see an article that we published, um, I think it came out earlier this year, technically, about, about this process of how this archive in Cleveland came together. Great talk, thanks, Jared. Thanks. Um, kind of ironic that um, we're about to have one of our biggest sporting events on Saturday, and you did the kneeling thing. Oh, I'm oh, sorry, I didn't see the microphone, I was like, who's talking? <laughs> okay. Um, so, this will probably get more of a reaction from the people in this audience than it will from you. But we've got one of our biggest sporting events on Saturday. And you talk about diversity, and our Australian Football League promotes diversity. But I can just imagine what the reaction would be if one of our Indigenous players knelt during the AFL Grand Final. I'm sorry, uh, it'll be difficult to ask the question because I'm trying to, still trying to formulate my head. We have the power of the archives. That's looking around the room. We're guilty as the SAA. We have the power. What can we do to give it up? Because effectively what you're saying, if I understood you correctly, is that the others have to <laughs> have the power. Yes. But they're not there. They don't have the power. 
They're not envisaged in our model of operations. What can we do? Yeah, um, that's a great question. So one of the things that um, I uh, had hoped would happen with this um, uh, forum in, in, in Portland was to share that power, right? So the power of the archive comes uh, and, and starts and ends at many different points. Um, but one of the ways which that power happens is actually right here at a professional conference. Um, professional conferences pr uh, publish proceedings. There are new ideas that get germinated here. There are new relationships that get formed here. Um, this is one great space and one great opportunity to begin to share that power. Um, so while I, I deemed what happened in Portland not to be uh, the success that I thought it would, um, I hope that SAA um, continues it or a rogue group of archivists continues it outside of SAA because they just screw things up. Um, to, to have these spaces where you literally ask um, communities to um, set the agenda. When you ask communities to share what um, needs they have pertaining to archives and records. I'll give you one very, uh, I, well, two examples. So um, what really hastened my fallout with professionalism and especially with like the conferences around professionalism was a conference I went to in New York City at Columbia University. And this conference was um, themed around issues of mass incarceration in the United States, which is uh, everyone, I hope here knows the United States is the largest uh, incarcerated in the world, and it's not even close. Um, so this conference, I think if you were on the outside looking in, you would assume that, oh, only attorneys or only um, legal scholars or people with all kinds of credentials show up. But instead, they said they wanted to attack the problem of mass incarceration by inviting everybody who's impacted by mass incarceration to this space. Um, so I went to panels, for instance, that had formerly incarcerated people moderating. Um, you had uh, victims moderating. There was this, this real cohesion around this topic that uh, people weren't vetted based on what degree they had or what kind of job title they had. Um, and that was a transformative experience for me. Um, and uh, those are the types of spaces that where I've been in when people gather to just literally talk about whatever um, uh, topic it is that they that they want in regards to, to archives. Uh, the other example I was going to give is that in um, Philadelphia, which is in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania in the US, um, in Pennsylvania law, if you get arrested and um, you're later found, uh, e either the police drop the charges and there's never like an actual um, charge or even a conviction, that record can stay with you uh, through the rest of your life. So employers, uh, when they're doing background checks, um, as I mentioned, or like let's say someone's applying for a job at SAA. SAA doesn't have a, in its policy um, a non-discrimination statement for convicted felons. So that person could be disqualified even though they were never convicted. So that's an archival concern, right? Um, and when I found out about this through some of the uh, social justice communities I was involved in, I was appalled. And I'm like, how many archivists out there uh, could be putting their time to use to figure out ways, I mean, because archivists are, and I'm sure Vern, I don't have to tell Vern this, like ultimate destroyers, right? And so and here's a case in which the archive is literally holding people back from moving forward with their lives. So I think having spaces where in which we learned, in, in which we learn with and alongside oppressed communities what their needs are, what their day-to-day -day needs are, not like, you know, what do you deem to be historically valuable, but like literally what are the archives and records problems that make your life harder, uh, that prevent you from moving forward in your in your day to day life. So I just think that these are great opportunities um, to to think about how we can take this conversation we're having and put them uh, in spaces where people can, other people can set the agenda and where other people can share with us what it is they need, what it is they would like to see. So I hope that answers your question. Um, means that archivists have got to become activists. They've got to embed themselves within the communities of you know, social justice and concern that, that concerns them. Otherwise, you can't work alongside or with. You, know, you need to ha actually share the same concerns as the people that, you, you know, that you're working with. Right. So um, I'm glad you said that because I've disagreed with myself about this point. Um, I just actually published, well, I'd written a book chapter last year, but this book chapter just came out. Um, 
And the title of this book is uh, social um, Using Social Media in Libraries, uh, published in, in, in the US. And I published a chapter about this project I did as an archivist at Princeton, in which I explicitly said, archivists should not try to become activists if they're not really about that life. Um, because it really is uh, something that I deemed um, not, and, and I actually based that on Andrew Flynn's definition. He, he has in, in that special issue of archival science, like these four categories of like activism and archives. Um, and so I think I talked about being an active archivist, which is that archivists need to be responsive and aware of the ways in which archives and records have direct import over people's day-to-day -day lives. Um, but actually, after reading Paulo Freire's Pedagogy of the Press, I kind of disagree with myself now. And I do um, lend myself towards the notion that um, uh, archivists uh, have to see within oppressed communities, again, just like the theory of hierarchy, right? We're all impacted by oppression. None of us are uh, um, at the, the, the summit of it. We all have some element of our identities that are oppressed. Um, and so the sooner that we can see the them as the us, the, the sooner we'll see that we have a linked uh, future and a linked fate together. So um, I think the word activist still tends to scare people and people will say like, you know, that's, that's not my job. Um, so I think now I'm on a mission to try to convince people that their oppressions are linked and that if um, uh, any of us are to really be free, then really all of us have to be free. So that's how I respond to that. I have great trouble with that um, title of yours because I always see uh, being in an archive as uh, freedom for the oppressed, not an oppressor. Um, to me, with these, when I see this footage, I see police with cameras documenting things, um, these records that they're being, are being created on the spot. It's a record keeping problem in the present. Archivists tend to be more relation to the past. I mean, we get these records after 25 years and then we do with them what we wish. But while these events are occurring, you've also got communities, uh, community people filming the acts as they're occurring. What's happening to all that footage? I feel that we have some sort of role to play in that sort of community archiving side. But there's a real conflict for me with regards to what our role is when we're really dealing with things that are happening after the effect, you know, after yeah. the act, um, in some cases a long time after the act. Yeah. Um, but having this sort of thing, I mean, I, I see archives as a way of, of breaking people out of these jails, not um, creating new ones. Right. And, and I think it, it's, it's all contextual. Um, my comments come from the US and often, in fact, the archive is uh, an ally in oppressing um, communities in, in our country um, to the point about the separation of time between when the record is created and when it might come to an archive. Um, for uh, four years at Princeton, I was a digital archivist, and my job was literally to help preserve the contemporary history that the university was generating. So um, it was in that capacity that I began to see the closing of that time frame um, because of the nature of digital information. The nature of digital information um, isn't the same with analog information where, uh, all right, you go store it, uh, in um, uh, uh, a record center box in, in a record center facility, and then after 25 years, the archivist has appraised it and decides whether it comes to the archives or whether it gets destroyed. Um, a lot of the times with police body cam footage, for instance, that stuff can be uh, erased uh, immediately, irrecoverably lost, damaged, manipulated. Um, so all that to say the moment of, of record to archive, especially when it's a, in a legal custody sense, um, that this video might um, uh, help land an officer in jail, that um, archival um, impulse, I think, is, is sort of more apparent. Um, and, it's, and so all that to say, this is a very unsettling space to be in, um, from talking and, and listening to archivists who've been in the field much longer, well, it doesn't take a lot to be in the field longer than I was in the field. Um, but um, there was definitely this kind of like, oh, that's, gonna, that's not gonna be an archival problem for at least a generation. Well, now with digital information, that archival problem is coming right now because of the change of pace in the technology. Um, if you have mobile devices, for instance, in which you've recorded police, um, uh, brutalizing uh, someone or, or um, a loved one. Um, if steps aren't taken to extract that video, to back it up, cables go obsolete, 
charges go obsolete, um, and then all of a sudden you won't have a chance to recover it a decade uh, or a generation from then. So it, it's, it's definitely, I think, a shortening of that, of that space, and that uh, I do account for that anxiety, and I know that's not um, something that archivists are used to doing, but I'm afraid we're going to have to get, well, I'm afraid you all are going to have to get um, a lot more, more comfortable with it. I have to stop saying we, because it's on y'all now. It's y'all's problem. Hi, and Adrian Cunningham. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to attempt to answer the very good question that Andrew War asked before about you know, what in concrete terms can we do, give a couple of possible answers, and then seek Jarrett's reaction to that to, to see whether you know, my thinking is barking up the right tree or, or not. So um, what can we do in concrete terms? Um, I guess to sum it up in, in a very shorthand, I, I'd pick up Barbara Reed's phrase of we need to stop being the God archivists um, and we need to um, open up the archival endeavour to anyone and everyone who wants to get involved in it and, and let them do it on their terms with our assistance if they want our assistance. Um, so, yeah, there's been over the years lots of good uh, um, suggestions and things that have been experimented with in terms of opening up descriptive practices to invite in um, the subjects of description, um, opening up appraisal um, to give um, the subjects of records um, um, some, some say in, in, in appraisal decisions. Um, but I would argue even that doesn't go far enough, that in fact we should surrender control of those decisions to the subjects and, and facilitate the process rather than try and control the process. But, but you know, just as an example, maybe 10 years ago when I was working at the National Archives of Australia, I attempted to get the NAA to go down the path of community consultation with appraisal. Um, I experienced a lot of resistance to that um, and it never went anywhere and it still hasn't gone anywhere. And so even that tentative first step of inviting people into the God archivist appraisal decision making process met with a lot of professional resistance and um, so it seems to me, Andrew, that there's an awful lot we can do and we need to um, be courageous enough to throw off those shackles and, and um, to say, okay, we're not the God archivists we might know a few things about how to do archiving, but really archiving is everyone's concern and everyone should be able to participate on their terms in the archival process. Jared, is that the kind of thing you're getting at? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and uh, forgive me for um, not putting it as, as clearly as, as you did there. Um, uh, there have been a number of projects I've been involved in where that's exactly what we did. So this project got started in Cleveland um, literally from archivists uh, conversing on Twitter and saying, hey, we're going to this city where we know this human rights uh, atrocity, this, these human rights atrocities just keep occurring. What can we do? One archivist who lived in that town went to uh, a few local activist meetings and said, hey, I'm an archivist. Um, and everyone said, what's an archivist? Um, <laughs> and she explained what she did and what her role was. And she said, I'm just here because there are going to be a gang of archivists who are coming here in the next couple of weeks. And if you all need help with any of your kind of like archives, records, documentation, information needs, we're here to help. And um, that kind of model. So one of the things we've done with that project is we've created, we, we turned over that control so that, um, as Catherine mentioned, I'm an advisory archivist, but I really don't have any power in terms of what comes into that archive and, what, um, and how it's represented. That's all on the, um, what we call the citizen archivists to decide. Um, but it was, really, it was, it was just as, as simple as, as showing up to a meeting and being forthcoming and forthright about what, um, uh, what value we add to society. And I think what, what hangs a lot of people up is that first step of like, well, what kind of like organizing or activist circle should I try to go to? Is that going to impugn my neutrality? Is that going to like, if I'm, if I'm supposed to be neutral and just a like passive collector, um, uh, showing up at an activist meeting is, is um, making me a biased, uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm um, taking one side or the other. And that's what we, a lot of the counter arguments we've had in the US. And 
Um, I, I think we've already chosen a side. Um, regardless, like neutrality is a side. As uh, I've heard said a number of times, when you're trying to go up a mountain, neutral is the same as reverse. Um, so that's how I respond to neutrality. Sorry if there are any neutrality uh, folks in the room. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.